Good afternoon. My name is Susan Madeira. I'm Academic Program Manager for High Impact Practices at Queensborough Community College. And I would like to welcome you to this afternoon's event. Speaking today is Marissa Berman, who has served as the Assistant Director of the Kufferberg Holocaust Resource Center at Queensborough since 2012. Prior to this position, she served as Executive Director of the Queens Historical Society, located at the Kingsland Homestead, New York City landmark, and part of the Historic House Trust of New York City from 2007 to 2012. She earned an MA in Fashion and Textile Studies, History, Theory, and Museum Practices from the Fashion Institute of Technology. Marissa also holds a BA in English Literature and a BPS in Fashion Design, both from Marist College. She was a participant in the 2012 Developing History Leaders at SHA program through the Association of State and Local History and the 2012 Institute for Cultural Entrepreneurship for Museum Leaders in Cooperstown, New York. She's a contributor to the website Narratively, named one of Time's 50 Best Websites of 2012. She is also a historian in the local history of New York and Long Island. Her publications include Images of America, Nunley's Amusement Park, and the forthcoming Historic Amusement Parks of Long Island. Marissa is with us today as part of the Common Read Initiative to share with us what's going on around the world and what's been going on historically as far as genocide. What does this have to do with the common read? Well, it has a lot to do with the common read. And so we're going to learn a little bit more about it in her presentation today. Right now, in the spring semester, approximately 1,400 students at Queensboro are reading The Road of Lost Innocence by Somali Mom. There's also one class at a local high school, Thomas Edison, who's reading the book at the same time. The goal of the common read is to have students read the text but not only read the text, but learn from it from many different points of view. Some students are in math classes, some are in criminal justice classes, psychology classes, English classes, academic literacy classes. The goal, again, is for you to look at this from many different perspectives. So we have designed co-curricular cross-disciplinary events to heighten your education. This is a place of higher learning, and our goal is for you to learn more than you ordinarily would in one class. So, with no further ado, I would like to introduce Ms. Marissa Berman. Thank you. All right, well, welcome, everybody. How many of you have been to the Holocaust Center before with your classes? Okay, all right, good, I'll take that. All right. So, one of the things that we do here is we talk about the history of the Holocaust, of course. We also talk about the history of what was happening in Asia during World War II. We talk about sex trafficking, we talk about genocide, we talk about human rights, so a lot of really heavy topics of conversation, but they're all really important because we want to gain a better sense of understanding about what people have experienced through time, right? H issues of human rights. So today what we're going to do is we're going to talk about human rights on a global scale, and we're going to go through some definitions, and we're going to focus on three different genocides that have taken place. So we're in Europe, we're going to focus on the Holocaust, and we're going to spend a little bit more time on that particular genocide since we are the Holocaust Center and that's our specialty. We're also going to talk about Cambodia, which is very fitting because that's where the Common Read book takes place. And we're also going to talk about the genocide in Rwanda. And then at the end, we're going to watch a very short film talking with two different people that experienced two different genocides and how they kind of um, became survivor soulmates. Okay, so let's just start with some very basic definitions. What is genocide? The deliberate and systematic destruction, in whole or in part, of an ethnic, racial, caste, religious, or national group. And these are some of the ways that this can be done. Now the first one is kind of obvious, killing members of the group. That's what we think of with genocide. We think of death, we think of murder, right? Causing serious bodily or mental harm to members of the group. Mental harm can still be genocide because the whole thing with genocide is getting into the heads of the people being targeted, right? Making them feel less than human, like they're not equal. So by attacking them on a mental level, we can still affect them and we can basically kind of kill their spirit in a sense. Deliberately inflicting on the group conditions of life calculated to bring about its physical destruction in whole or in part imposing measures to prevent births within the group. How do you prevent a birth? Abortion. Yep, definitely, abortion. How else? What do you do to prevent, to not get pregnant? 
How about anything? What? Yeah, exactly. Contraceptives, right? Definitely. What else? Who is able to give birth? Right. So we could, we could kill all the women. We could separate the men and women, right? What do people do sometimes when they decide, I don't want to have any more children? There's a procedure they can have, right? Sterilization, right? like a vasectomy, where their tubes tied, right? So there's surgical procedures. And people do this all the time because they don't want to have any more children, or they don't want to have children at all, or maybe they have a sickness they don't want to pass on to their children, right? So why would you think preventing a birth is a, is a type of genocide? Because you're not actually hurting anything necessarily, right? How is that a genocide? Exactly. You're not allowing the population to expand. If you have two people, let's just say that they're Jewish, and they're not able to continue on their race, when they die, so ends the race, right? So you're not just murdering members of the group. It's more long term, it's more planned, but ultimately the same goal will happen, that the race will end. Forcibly transferring children of the group to another group. So again, this doesn't seem that bad. You're not hurting anyone necessarily. But this can still be genocide, and it's the same reason as the last one. If you have a couple, you have a Jewish couple, and they have a child, and you take that child and give it to another family, let's say they're Catholic, those parents are going to raise the child with what they know, right? Their religion, their beliefs, their cultural heritage. So even though that child is technically Jewish, they won't know anything about their own culture, so that knowledge will die. So ultimately, it's the same thing. And again, much more long-term, much more planned, but it leads to the same thing with that race being ended. All genocides are made up of three components, an instigator, a targeted group, and an intent. So if we look at something, how many of you studied the Holocaust when you were like in high school or something? Okay. In the case of the Holocaust, who was the instigator? Who was the person? Hitler, right, and what's the group? The Nazis, the Nazis exactly. Who was the targeted group? The Jews. Who else? The Roma or Gypsies, right? The Jehovah's Witnesses, homosexuals, anyone that was physically disabled or handicapped, anyone that didn't fit into that Aryan race, right? The blonde hair, blue eyed, that perfect race was targeted by the Nazis. And then what was the intent? What was the goal? To destroy the race, right? To get rid of all the Jews, to get rid of everyone that didn't live up to the standards. Okay. So all genocides are made up of eight stages. We're going to go through each one. Classification. All cultures have categories to distinguish people into us and them by ethnicity, by race, by religion, or nationality. Right? So giving each group a label. Symbolization. We give names or symbols to the classifications. We name people or distinguish them by colors or dress and apply them to members of the group. When combined with hatred, symbols may be forced upon unwilling members of pariah groups. So with the knowledge you have already of the Holocaust, can you think of a symbol that was used to identify the Jews? Exactly. The yellow star that was made to wear, made to be worn by the Jews and they would wear on the front and on the back of their shoulders, on all of their clothes, so they could always identify them, right? Dehumanization. One group denies the humanity of the other group. Members are equated with animals, vermin, insects, or diseases. Dehumanization overcomes the normal human revulsion against murder. If these people that are being targeted aren't looked at as equals, they're looked at less than humans, they're looked at like bugs, like rodents, then it's easier for these groups to hate them, right? And it's easier to harm them because you're not putting them at the same level. It's like they're not even human. Organization. Genocide is always organized, usually by the state, though sometimes informally or by terrorist groups. Special army units or militias are often trained and armed, and plans are made for genocidal killings. Genocide is very different from the atrocities that take place during war. Right? This is very planned, this is premeditated, it can't just spontaneously happen. There is a lot of organization that happens in order for this to occur. Polarization. Extremists drive the groups apart. Hate groups broadcast polarizing propaganda. What is propaganda? 
We see it every day with like newspaper advertisements and things. But what is propaganda? It's putting an idea into your head, but making you think that you came up with it, right? And think of it with like products or advertisements. You need to get this cream. It will solve all your problems, right? And you see it and you're like, I must get this, right? It just gets into your head. Laws may forbid intermarriage or social interaction. Extremist terrorism targets moderates, intimidating and silencing the center. So the moderates in this case are people that maybe don't fall to either extreme. Maybe they don't support the group, but they're not completely against it, right? And that's the group that's usually targeted by the terrorists because they want to get them on their side. Right? Preparation. Victims are identified and separated out because of their ethnic or religious identity. Death lists are drawn up. Members of victim groups are forced to wear identifying symbols, and they are often segregated into ghettos, forced into concentration camps, or confined to a famine-struck region and starved. Extermination. This is the point where the mass killings begin. It's extermination to the killers because they don't believe their, hu their victims to be fully human. When it's sponsored by the state or the government, the armed forces often work with militias to do the killing. Sometimes this results in revenge killings by groups against each other, creating a cycle of bilateral genocide. And this makes sense, right? If your group is being targeted, your first response might be to attack back. And then it just keeps going back and forth. Right? And then finally, the eighth stage is denial. It always follows a genocide. And it's among the surest indicators of further genocidal massacres. The perpetrators will try to cover up the evidence and intimidate the witnesses. They deny that they committed any crimes, and they often blame what happened on the victims. They block investigations of the crimes and continue to govern until they're driven from power by force when they flee into exile. So the first, the first genocide that we're going to focus on took place in Europe, and that's the Holocaust. Now, I'm sure, as you all said, that you pretty much studied the Holocaust at some point in school, so you might know some of this already. But to just sum up what the Holocaust was, it was the mass murder or genocide of approximately six million Jews during World War II, a program of systematic state or government-sponsored murder by Nazi Germany, led by Adolf Hitler and the Nazi Party throughout the German Reich and German-occupied territories. Now, you may not have ever heard of this, but the word Holocaust stems from the Greek and it means whole burnt. So entirely burnt. Why do you think burnt from what you know of the Holocaust? What did they do? They burned the bodies, right? Now, in Jewish custom, cremation is not allowed. The body is supposed to go into the ground whole. You're supposed to be buried whole. So if you were um, a soldier, let's say, and you lost your arm in battle, technically you're supposed to be buried with that arm. You're supposed to go into the ground whole. So the fact that all of these people were murdered and then their bodies were burned added even more insult to what was happening because it went against their religion. The Holocaust is also referred to as the Shoah or HaShoah in Hebrew and that translates to the catastrophe. And you've always found this interesting because it's not just catastrophe. Obviously this was a horrific event, but the catastrophe. This was the worst thing that has ever and hopefully will ever happen to the Jewish people, right? So it kind of makes it more finite. Puts in an exclamation point on it. So who is this? Rep. Everyone knows Hitler, right? <coughs> this is an image from the, the night that he was elected chancellor. And I think it's really interesting because it's like they're looking at him like he's what? Like a king or something, right? Or like the Pope, just trying to catch a glimpse of him. The thing to remember is when Hitler came into power, he immediately wasn't like, hey, let's murder all the Jews, right? No one would have followed him. But you have to think about what Germany was like at this time. Germany did not do well in World War I, right? So there was low morale from that. And then the Depression came in 1929. So people didn't have money. They didn't have jobs. They didn't have enough food to feed their families. So it was a really difficult time to be living in Germany. When Hitler came into power, he said, I'm going to make Germany strong again. Everyone's going to have a job. Everyone's going to have money. And people were enraptured by that idea. And that's what they wanted, too. They wanted that power. They wanted Germany to be strong again. So they followed him. Now, what is this symbol? What's this symbol called? The swastika, right. And it represents what party? 
the Nazi party, right? What do you think of when you see this image? And for me, it brings up just like an anxiety, like hatred of death. I think of the Holocaust when I see it. But the interesting thing is, is this symbol has had a very long history. For thousands of years, it's been used in ancient civilizations around the world, like India, Iran, Nepal, China, Japan, Korea, and Europe. And if you look at the Sanskrit definition of it, it translates into good to be, to be good. It's kind of the exact opposite of what we think of now, right? The Nazi party took on this symbol to represent them in 1920, and now it's been associated with the Nazi party. Right? And we associate with it concepts like anti-Semitism, hatred, violence, death, and murder. And it's actually outlawed in Germany. You cannot display the symbol or you will be arrested. So it's interesting to look back on this and see that this symbol has very different roots and it means something very different to other cultures, but it is completely tarnished today. You couldn't just get a tattoo of it, right, if you like the historic meaning and walk around because everyone would question that. They would think that you were a Nazi, right, or that you supported that party. So it's completely destroyed. The Nazi government sought, using legitimate institutions of the state, to explain, justify, and camouflage its actions. The result of those measures was to denigrate, to isolate, and eventually destroy large numbers of German citizens. Those so designated were people suffering from mental illness, physical deformity, mental handicaps, epilepsy, blindness and deafness, as well as Jehovah's Witnesses, the Roma and homosexuals, right? So we talked about that a little bit before. They were targeting anyone that didn't fit into this ideal Aryan race. So how did they do this? They slowly took away the rights of all the Jews. It started with boycotts of Jewish-owned businesses, but they were able to stay in existence, right? Other Jews would still shop at them. Then Jews are dismissed from all governmental jobs. So teachers, sanitation, anything in a government institution, at a time where people desperately needed to keep their jobs, right? They really needed the income. Then they were prohibited from owning land. So today they might own a house and two acres, and tomorrow they have nothing. And then the Nuremberg Laws go into effect, which took away their German citizenship. And it raises an interesting question you know, for you. If someone asks you, what's your religion and what's your nationality, what nation you identify with, what would you put first? Would you say, I'm a Jewish American? Would you say, I'm a Canadian Christian? Like, what would you prioritize? And it's gonna be different for everyone, what you think. But during this time, many of these people said, I am German, and my religion just happens to be that of Judaism. So when their citizenship was taken away, when they belonged to no nation, they were really insulted, right? It was really hurtful for them. Then marriage between Jews and non-Jews becomes a criminal act. It becomes illegal, and if you're already married, it's null and void. And then it just gets crazy. Jews are forbidden from attending plays, concerts, going to public pools, going to the movie theaters. It became illegal for a Jew to own a dog. Owning a pet doesn't really seem like a right or a privilege, but it is, right? We're taking care of a life. But they were trying to take away everything, right? Because they didn't want them to be felt as equals. Then all Jewish shops are closed and a curfew goes into effect. November 9th into the 10th of 38 was an event called Kristallnacht, the night of the broken glass. And this was really the transition point for the Jews living in, in Nazi Germany. It was when their friends and neighbors turned on them and they went through the town and destroyed the storefronts of any businesses that were owned by Jews. They spray painted graffiti on these buildings, on Jewish schools, on the synagogues, and they set fire to some of these buildings as well as destroying religious documents. And about 30,000 Jews were arrested at this time and taken to concentration camps. What's happening here? What is he doing? He's measuring her nose, right? Why? How could you tell? What's the stereotype about Jews? They all, big noses, right? All Jew, have you heard that before? All Jews have big noses. It's a very common stereotype for the Jews. So what's happening here is he's checking, to, exactly as you said, to see if she's a Jew. And she's willingly letting it happen, right? Because she's like, I'm not a Jew. It's fine. 
And this type of thing was actually happening. It looks very serious, right? He's wearing a lab coat. He looks like a doctor or a scientist. Don't you think he kind of has a big nose? Right? Because what kind of a science is this? Anyone can have a big nose or a small nose. But this was the mentality then. It was about identifying all of the Jews and targeting them. Then what we call the final solution took place. And that was to get rid of all of the Jews. So think of it like an infestation of something in your house or apartment. The first step is to identify it, right? What is the problem? Is it a roach? Is it a rat? And then you try to get them all together into one place, like using a trap, right? To attract them all. That way you can see how many you have. And then you exterminate the problem. And that's exactly what Nazi Germany did. They identified the Jews in the communities. They grouped the Jews together in ghettos. They forced them to leave their homes, take some possessions. And then they eventually relocated them to the different camps, to death camps, concentration camps, and work camps, with the ultimate goal of exterminating all of them. The next genocide we're going to talk about is that of Cambodia in Asia. So the Holocaust was taking place during World War II, right? over 70 years ago. This we're talking about closer to in the 30s and 40 years ago, right? Between 1975 and 1979, over 1.5 million people, about 21% of the population of Cambodia, were worked, starved, and beaten to death. This genocide took place when a communist minority called the Khmer Rouge, led by Pol Pot, seized control of the country and imposed a regime of terror on the population in order to establish a regimented communist dictatorship. The regime tried to eradicate Buddhism from Cambodia by prosecuting and massacring monks. What do monks do? What are they like? Like priests, right? So they're studying religion. It's a very peaceful group, and that's the group that was targeted. Of the 70,000 monks that were living in Cambodia prior to 1975, only about 2,000 survived. The regime also tried to eradicate all ethnic minorities. The entire Vietnamese community was either driven out or murdered. Over 50% of the 425,000 Chinese were worked or starved to death. And of the 250,000 Muslims, only 90,000 survived. 40% of the Thai population, about 80,000 people, were also murdered. The aim was to eliminate any foreign influence in the country and cut the country off from any outside contact, right? So to keep it as it was in that exact moment. It also meant destroying whatever urban societies were created. Because when we have these urban societies, these pockets of culture, right, and evolved ideas happen, but they didn't want that. They wanted things to stay exactly as it was. Their regime was overthrown by an invasion of the Viet Vietnamese, which then instituted its own repressive government. Finally, the genocide that took place in Rwanda. The planned annihilation of the Tutsi tribe in Rwanda took place in 1994, so really not that long ago. Wiped out one-tenth of Rwanda's population, about 700,000 people. The Hutus were the dominant power in the country, and they had a long-standing hatred for the Tutsis, who had been favored by the Belgians when they controlled the country. The Belgians divided the groups along racial lines and instituted the process of registration. And this makes a lot of sense. The Belgians encouraged the antagonism between the tribes in order to maintain their control of the country, right? If they kept these groups separate and hating each other, it would work better for their purposes, because if they united, then they could easily over overthrow the Belgians, right? In 1962, Rwanda became an independent state, and the Belgians shifted their support to the group that had the majority, which was the Hutus. So the Tutsis, which once were in favor by the Belgians, now became the hated other. And the government, in its propaganda, labeled them as insects. They called them cockroaches. And they said that they had to be eliminated. The killing phase of the genocide was sparked by the assassination of the Hutu president of the country on April 6, 1994. 
This was an act that was never fully investigated and the killers were never identified. Tutsi leaders were murdered and killing squads began the genocide defined as public work in the propaganda. The government coordinated the killing process, but regular people went about and killed their neighbors. Thousands of Tutsi refugees fled to neighboring countries, but many times they were pushed back into the arms of awaiting murderers. Many countries have different quotas for how many immigrants they'll allow in. The United States says that as well. But imagine what these people were like. They were refugees, right? They were fleeing with nothing, just whatever clothes they were wearing on their back. So these governments even more so wanted to push them out because they couldn't contribute at all to their societies. The UN, the United Nations, did nothing to protest this genocide. And the US did not even step in and aid the victims. And we didn't even identify it as a genocide until later. And President Clinton later apologized for this. So looking at all three of these examples, we can see how they fall into these different categories. And the last thing that I wanted to show you is uh, a short film called Survivor Soulmates. This film talks about a survivor of the Holocaust and a survivor of the Rwandan genocide and a friendship that came between them. Does anyone have any questions? I know it's a lot of information. We have handouts here that have a lot of the different notes. More than six million Jews and approximately five million others throughout Europe were exterminated by the Nazi regime during the Holocaust, considered the worst atrocity against mankind. Fifty years later, during a civil war in Rwanda, more than 800,000 people were slaughtered by Hutu extremists. This is a story of how two genocide survivors crossed over continents, cultures, and generations to discover each other. Theirs is a story of hope and of the strength of the human spirit. The Holocaust is remembered as the most heinous crime against civilization. David Gewurzman was just an 11-year-old boy growing up in the small town of Lushitsa, Poland, when the Nazi occupation began. He and his family escaped death, hidden by a Polish farmer for two years beneath a pigsty in a rat-infested pit. David and his family were the lucky ones. 8,000 Jewish people lived in the ghetto. Uh, by the end of the uh, war, uh, out of the 8,000, 16 came out alive. Everybody else was killed. Uh, I was one of the lucky, very few lucky people in that my whole family survived. David escaped to the U.S. and began his new life as the world vowed we would never witness such an atrocity again. Fifty years later, a different continent, a different country, and a nine-year-old Rwandan girl named Jacqueline Murakikete had no idea what her future would hold. We started hearing uh, Hutu extremists, Hutus uh, being the majority ethnic group in Rwanda. We started hearing them uh, saying that Tutsis, uh, my ethnic group, and the minority ethnic group in Rwanda, the Tutsis were uh, among other things, uh, cockroaches, or there were snakes, the Tutsis uh, deserve to die, and they started encouraging uh, Hutus everywhere in Rwanda to start killing um, their Tutsi neighbors. Jacqueline found refuge in an orphanage, and when 100 days of carnage ended, she looked forward to being reunited with her family. An uncle broke the news. Um, I was told that one day during the genocide, uh, my neighbors had come, and they had taken my parents and my six siblings, and most of my aunts and uncles, and most of the Tutsis in the village, and they had taken them to um, a nearby river where they proceeded to butcher them with machetes. Eventually granted asylum in the U.S., Jacqueline was adopted by her uncle and began her education. Meanwhile, David, retired and in his 70s, began to speak before young people to educate them on the horrors of the Holocaust. Usually in every city, they make all the Jews come down into the square, like I mentioned before, in our town. They load them up into cattle cars. They're all killed. Then the bodies are put into these ovens, and they are burned. 
One day, in a classroom where David was speaking, Jacqueline discovered a survivor soulmate. Both of us were children, you know, surrounded by, by siblings, by friends, with goals and dreams, and how all that was uh, taken away. So moved by David's story, Jacqueline wrote him a letter and shared her story. The pictures in the New York Times, the pictures on television, seeing bodies floating down the river. These people were the same people that I have seen being killed in Poland. The Holocaust was repeating itself. The world has not learned. And all of a sudden, she became a cause, Jacqueline's letter, and my hair stood up. It was so powerful, so emotional, uh, and, and it had such a message to me. So I didn't really understand uh, what had happened in Rwanda. I couldn't understand how my neighbors had killed my family and then coming to this country and of course learning later on that so many countries knew that this was happening, that this is something that was on CNN, on BBC. Jacqueline and David are on a mission together to educate the world, and especially young people, to embrace individual differences and promote compassion and understanding of what makes each life unique. She being young and I not so young, uh, she being black, I being white, from Africa, from Europe, Jewish, Christian, in every possible way we were so different. Yet because of our experiences, we felt so close together that we were like brother and sister. As a survivor, I do have responsibility to, um, to my parents, to my siblings, to all my relatives who, who died, to tell the story of their death in hopes, of course, of preventing uh, future genocides such as that which occurred. If we're going to keep hatred in our own hearts for the rest of our lives and also have our children infected with that feeling, the world is going to continue in that manner. Let's not forget what happened, but let's learn from it so that we will not repeat the things that what our parents or grandparents have done. questions or anything about what we saw? All right, well, thank you so much for coming. I hope that you learned a little bit about some of these other examples of genocide. There are copies here of um, some of the, the eight stages of genocide, which you're welcome to take. So we'll see you again soon, All right? Some of the things that you saw today may, you may find disturbing, and some of the contents of the book you may find disturbing as well. We just want you to know that the counseling center here has many people who have actually read the book, and if you would like to speak to them about it, you certainly can. The counseling center is located in the library building, room 422. Just please identify yourself when you get to the desk as someone who's participating in the common read, and they will make sure that you speak to someone who's able to work with you uh, on whatever the issue may be and it's completely confidential, so you wouldn't have to worry about anyone hearing about your feelings. Um, I want to thank you for coming today, and I also want to thank Ms. Berman for presenting human rights violations on a global scale. You can tell that she really uh, did a lot of research to put this together for you, and she gave us a lot of information in a very short period of time. 
You can tell the genocides have been going on for years, and I welcome you to come to the Kufferberg Center and look at these panels that are on the walls. Um, the first one speaks of Armenia in 1915, and then as we go around the room, you'll see these panels continue on. Genocide is something that didn't happen just once, or twice, or three times. Uh, we, we saw three examples here today, but if you look on the walls and at these panels, you'll see that it's gone on for a very long time and it continues to go on. I want to ask you, what, what can we possibly do to stop this from happening? But do you think it's just money alone? No, but money like has a big... Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, I think education. It's it's educate like people. It's education. And, you know, we're, again, we're in, we're in college right now. How many of you were aware of these things before you got to Queensboro, before reading this book? Okay, some of you. Did you know about all of this? Did you know about... Two of, two of them. them. Okay, that's good. Did you know about any of these? No. I just knew about like, Germany. That's it. Okay, you knew about Germany and you? Just Germany, okay? Germany. Germany, okay. So, I mean, the Holocaust, because it is such a huge atrocity, many of you did learn about it in school. But many people don't know about these other things that are going on. And the way to end things like this is through education. If you're in a country where something like this is going on, you're, and you're educated, you can stand up and say something about it. Um, even in the United States, if something like this were to start to happen now, you've been educated, right? And, and you could identify the signs, and maybe you could contact someone, write to your congressman, write to your senator, write to the president, email them, text, tweet, he does all of that, right? Uh, but you have to let them know you have a voice as a citizen. Uh, you live in this country, so you have a voice, and you really should be heard. We have someone coming to the college next Wednesday and it's Senator Jose Peralta from Jackson Heights, and we hope that you can join us for that. Jackson Heights is the hotbed of human trafficking in Queens, probably the hotbed of human trafficking in the United States. And he's written a lot of legislature, and he's trying to stop this. So if you can, please come to the event. He's gonna to speak to us about what he's been doing and what he's doing to try and stop this. Um, so that's next, Wednesday, next, I'm sorry, next Thursday, April 3rd. But tomorrow, in this very room, we have a, a wonderful event. When you enter the Kufferberg Center, did you notice these watercolors on the wall? There were these portraits of, of women? Yeah, okay. Well, the artist is going to actually be here tomorrow to speak to us about these women. Marissa, can you tell us a little bit about? Yeah, he's, he's going to talk about um, the comfort women and what happened to them. So it was during the same time that this genocide, the Holocaust, was taking place in, in Europe, but this was what was happening in Asia. and. Uh, during World War II, Japan, as a way to appease and boost the morale of their soldiers, went into Korea and parts of China and kidnapped about 200,000 teenage girls between the age of 13 and 18 and forced them into sexual slavery. And they called them comfort women because they were providing comfort to the soldiers. And these women were raped brutally dozens of times a day by all these soldiers. Of the 200,000, about 100,000 of them died during this time from their wounds, from the beatings, from trying to escape, from STDs they contracted from the soldiers, or from suicide. And it's not very talked about in our history books. So we've been trying to kind of shine some light so that the story of these women isn't forgotten. And the artists that created these portraits will be coming. We're going to show a short documentary about these women as well. Thank you. So it's an opportunity for you to learn about more things that are going on, or things that have gone on globally, and these women were victims. Um, and if you look at them, and I, I'm, I'm looking at a woman's eyes right now through, through, the, through the door, and it's as if she's staring at me saying, help me. And it is, it's so sad that in, even in this country, we didn't know that this was going on. So again, it's education. We're here to educate you and enlighten you. And we hope that you've taken something away from today's event. And we look forward to seeing you at other common read events. So thank you very much. And, and thank you, Marissa.